It's time now for our final speaker of the evening. And we have Monir Samuel, who is a fascinating guy. Um, he is Egyptian Dutch and is a political scientist and an author and a journalist. And he's worked across, well, more than 60 countries, basically, and has written many, many books. So we have a fantastic story from Munir coming up. So please give a very, very warm round of applause to Munir. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> Always great to receive the applause beforehand, so I can go now. So uh, please uh, look to your favorite person sitting next to you and say, Assalamu alaikum and then turn to your other neighbor that's apparently not your favorite and say, Walaikum is Salam. <laughs> and so hereby we have all wished in peace to each other, which is a good, th good way to start an evening, I guess, or end it. Uh, this is a crash course Arabic for more lessons, please, no. Anyway, so <laughs> um, my name is Monir indeed, and I live here in Amsterdam. I live in New West, best part of town if you dare to live. <laughs> Yo, West Side. So, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was standing in front of the Albert Heijn of the Jan, at the Jan Eversenstraat with my bike and my hand, and I was actually sharing a post that I wrote, an essay that I wrote for the Groene Amsterdammer, which is the Dutch equivalent to the New Yorker, uh, and it's an essay that is more than six years old now, in which I actually um, stipulate my worries about growing identity politics. Uh, and the identity strife that we have. And it's an essay in which I predict the consequences of identity politics for the Netherlands, and in which I give also solutions to identity politics. But it was way before time, like nobody even knew what I was talking about, which is usually the case with me. But anyway, so now this essay is popping up again, and I was sharing that on my phone, and suddenly there is this huge guy standing right behind me, a white man, age 50. Uh, let's call him Hank and Ingrid <laughs> for the Dutch part of the audience. And Mr. Hank Ingrid uh, not, not knocks on my shoulder and says, you have been standing here for 30 minutes now and if you're not gone in 50 minutes, I will call the police. <laughs> well, I'm quite well with time. And this is me like, what the? Mm. Uh, and I'm then like, Excuse me, sir, first, it was 12 minutes and 30 seconds, because I can see here when I posted this essay. Second, why can't I stand in the street? You know exactly why you can't stand here. No, sir, I don't. And for the clarification, it was Friday afternoon, three, three-ish, busy, crowded supermarket, only white people, of course, because New West is also like gentrification, let's... So, anyway... A lot of white people. I didn't know where my sahbis were at that point in time. <laughs> and, and so I'm standing there and I'm feeling very, very small. And I'm looking up like this to Mr. Hank Ingrid and I said, sorry, sir, but I'm not moving. This is my street. And this is my overpriced grocery store <laughs> with my hummus with mango. So I am standing here. And I saw people first looking at me like, you know, sorry, but the guy got, angrier and angrier, and at some point you saw people getting scared and moving away and looking at me with looks like, what does he have in his backpack? It was an e-reader and uh, uh, sunglasses, but uh, no sun, of course. So anyway, <clears throat> and, and he said, I am calling the police, I'm gonna stand here. You have 13 minutes still, and I will call the police. And he just posted right behind me. And I was like, okay, what do I do now? I kept talking to him. I kept asking him what his issue was. He didn't want to say. He was smart enough not to say. Of course, I knew what his issue was, but he wasn't saying it. And the looks just got worse and worse. So he was looking at his watch. 12, 11, 10. And I was like, I can, I can count, sir. I can. And you can keep counting, but I will stand here. And the guy was growing bigger and bigger. At some point, I was like, I will call the police myself. <laughs> so I called the police. I said, where my name? I said, where I was? I said, there was this guy, very intimidating. I said that I was suspecting a racial bias here and that this was a street that I wanted to stand on and that was, he, he was basically pushing me out of the street. 
And then the police asked me why I didn't right away. I said, because this is the street. Do we want citizens to push each other from the street or giving like uh, blockades? And by the way, I am scared that if I will actually bike away, he will just follow me. And then the police got really, really mad on the phone and said, stop playing tricks with us, and they hang up. And the guy, of course, heard everything. So now he felt even more entitled to be this good guy, Hank and Ingrid, who is protecting the street of a coming catastrophe, which is me. I got to him. At some point, I turned around. I walked to him and said, sir, what are you afraid of? He says, you know exactly how this looks like. I said, how does it look like? What do you think? What do you think you see? Because I can tell you one thing. Whatever you think you're seeing, it's not right. And it, it brought me back to 9-11. Um, I was actually watching CNN when the first plane crashed and then the second hit the tower. So I was watching it live. At some point, I called my dad. I said, you better go home, get home, because it is a huge thing, the world has changed. And I was only 13, and I, I felt the change. I felt it. And I definitely felt it the day after, because when I biked home from school, 13-year-old kid, I was kicked off my bike, beaten up by three boys, because the first hijacker's name that came out was Mohammed Atta, and he was an Egyptian. And there I was, the child of a terrorist, because my dad is Egyptian, and no, his name is not Mohammed Atta. And when I was standing there at the Albert Heijn, well, actually, at the street before the Albert Heijn, and I saw all these looks of suspicion and fear, something broke in me. Because that was not, not, not for me and not for those memories, but for all those guys, all those little moles, just like me, who cannot sit in the tram, who cannot travel around by tube, who cannot sit in the bus, who cannot go to a grocery store without being watched, without being feared, without being talked about, without being looked at. You can have your beard and it's fancy. I have my beard and it's called Islamization. Well, the Islamization of my face is going all right. And so at some point, I looked at the guy and I said, sir, you see this? And I went into my shirt. And I can tell you people were doing like this. <laughs> like I was about to draw out my AK-47. <laughs> it's not, it's my cross. And I told him, sir, I'm a Christian. I'm not even a Muslim, which wouldn't even make me a terrorist. But I'm a Christian, and Jesus loves you. <laughs> <clears throat> and <clears throat> he looked at me and was very silent for a very long time, because I think he had to come out with something. <laughs> and then Mr. Hank and Ingrid said, I know one thing. In my church, there is no room for people like you. And I said, so? Because Jesus only died for your sins, sir. And he said, just that you know, just that you know. And I biked off at that point. And he followed me all the way till I stopped at the police station. And when I entered the police station, one cop immediately got assistance. Now there were two. They took my identity card, kept it for more than 40 minutes, and questioned me 40 minutes to check if I wasn't a terrorist. I am not a Muslim, but I did study Islamic law in Leiden and in Egypt, in Cairo the base of Islamic Sunni law. Um, after 9-11, the day 9-11 happened, actually, I realized people would never look at me the same way. And so, unexpectedly, I became a, a person in the midst of this anti-Muslim, Islamophobic, populist strife. But in the same time, I'm part of the Coptic Egyptian Christian minority. And for anyone who ever watches the news, the cops are a lot, like, especially the last couple of years, very much attacked by extremists. And dozens and dozens of churches were burned down. My family was shot at. I was shot at. I was discriminated against. 
I had so many things happening to me as a Christian minority in Egypt and then as a Christian minority here in the Netherlands, because there's another word next to Islamophobia and it's called Christianophobia, because that cross has also been pulled off my, off my uh, neck many times here in clubs and cafes. And I can tell you this, those same left progressive people that might scream and run when a girl's uh, headscarf is pulled off, don't do anything when my cross is pulled off my neck. Because yeah, hey, Christianity isn't that sexy. Uh, but, but anyway, being a minority in both places and then being criticized in both places for being a Christian but being considered a Muslim is a very strange place to be at. And it actually leaves you with, like, leaves you with two choices. Either you become very Islamophobic and very mad because of all those Muslims you are now considered also a Muslim and so hence you are, blah, blah, blah. Or you just embrace that identity as much as you can. And for me, I just decided as a teenager already to really, really look for God beyond religion and to go for relationship with God and not for doctrine, to be a believer and not religious. And that's how I found a freedom way beyond any boundaries. And I especially found a love for Muslims that many Christians also in the Netherlands lack. And so I studied the Quran, I studied the Hadith, I studied Fiqh, which is the, the Islamic uh, Sharia and jurisprudence. I started to have a lot of Muslim friends, first in Egypt, then in the Netherlands. And then, at some point, this happened. The Arab Revolutionary Movement and the Egyptian uprising. Now, I was already writing about Egypt a lot, also for newspapers. I already wrote a couple of books in my puberty years. I have always been quite quick with things. And so, when the uprising against Hosni Mubarak started in Egypt in 2011, we had no journalists and correspondents there because they considered the Arab world uninteresting and nothing ever happens there. So we just put one journalist in Beirut because that's cool and that's it. So there was no one stationed in Tunisia. The Dutch media totally missed Tunisia until Ben Ali fell down. It was like, oh, wow, okay. Hmm. And then the uprising in Egypt started and they had no one to explain what was going on. But I already predicted it in certain articles because I was aware of what was happening among my generation in Egypt. And so suddenly, from one day to another, I was the youngest political analyst on Dutch TV, the first analyst of color, person of color. Um, the, and then, wait, I'm waiting for some images here. The first female analyst in the Netherlands, the first colored female in this position, and a lot of other things. I was still married to my husband in the time, but we separated the day of the fall of Hosni Mubarak because I realized that I cannot talk about my Egyptian people fighting for their freedoms while I'm still engaged in a marriage that was never made for me and that was constructed by all these expectations and not by the love that I had for women. I just love you, I can't help it. And so I came out First person of color lesbian in the media. First Christian lesbian in the media. First Arab Christian in, lesbian in the media. First Arab lesbian in the media. And I can go on and on and on. And with every step that I took, I became less of a profession and more of an object and a phenomena. So for example, the moment that I came out I was no longer a political scientist, I was that lesbian, and I didn't even identify as a woman, as you can now clearly see. And so, I want to say something about white, about white privilege, and I will only say it once, but white privilege is not to have an adjective in front of your profession. Not to be that gay in the workforce, not to be that black in the workforce, not to be that trans in the workforce, not to be that Arab in the workforce, not to be that Muslim colleague in the workforce, not to be that black friend, not to be that colored partner, but to be what you do. That's only for white people <laughs> who are straight, who are cisgendered. I mean, there are many other things that you need to tick off, of course. So when I came out and I started to discover my love for women, I turned out to have a tendency to fall in love 
with Arab women, and especially with Muslim women. I, I've never, like, I can tell you this, my sexual orientation is very complicated and it's very easy. I fall for forbidden love. <laughs> the most complicated love, that's me. So I fell in love with an Egyptian Dutch girl, and we had the most romantic, sexy romance. I mean, two Egyptians, oh my God. Passion is like redefined. <laughs> but she was a Muslim from the North Delta with very strong Islamic Muslim Brotherhood ties. And I was a Christian from the Said. Now the Delta, and especially her city, Mansoura, is known for being the most pretty women. And the Said is known for having the most stubborn men. You got the picture. And so I kept running after her, and she kept running away and coming back and all that. <clears throat> and then at some point, her mom realized that she was in touch with me. Only that. She wasn't aware that we were touching each other, but she was in touch with me. And her mom, living here in Amsterdam, first burned herself and then tried to drown herself in the gracht, in the canals here. And you can laugh, but it's not funny. It's the most narcissistic dominant parenthood that you could think of just to intimidate her child of never ever seeing me again. And so you can understand that at some point I saw her break down, I lost her, I was very unsafe myself. The mother found out where I lived. I was like rushing off, constantly afraid of the Egyptian community. Egyptian, Egyptians are the fifth largest group here in Amsterdam. And suddenly you realize that there is social control all over the city, and that if you touch one, you touch all. And so my life became very dangerous, even though I traveled as a Middle East correspondent in female form all over the world, but especially in war areas. I was hijacked, I was arrested, I was imprisoned, I was sexually arrested, I was raped. But the biggest unsafety was here in Amsterdam for being in love with an Egyptian girl. And then I came out again, and this time as me, Monir, gender queer, a feminine guy, not a masculine woman. It's a huge difference. And I was never invited back to the talk shows. I can show you hundreds of hours of me being on all those TV shows, radio shows, whatever, sidekick at Radio 1, whatever. The moment I said I'm Monir, I lost all of it. I was never asked back again, because now all I was was a transgender. No speaking engagements here, I will just say it, Pakhuis. No speaking engagement in the Bali, not at the New Liefde, not at any of those other places where I used to be in all those debates. And when I asked the new newspapers where I couldn't write for them anymore, they said, but you have no expertise but sex and gender. Talking about objectification, this is the largest object objectification <laughs> That I, that I could ever think of. And there I was, being this man, this me, and all that people see was this one-dimensional identity, this body that you have to measure and see if it passes or not and fits to your liking. And now it was such a waste of those beautiful girls and so on and so forth. And you used to be so nice. And you used to be so intelligent. Like I all lost it by being who I am. As you can see, my relationship with my Egyptian Dutch lover didn't last long. She left the day that I got my first shot of testosterone. I lost everything, basically. My work, my position, all my study qualifications, my passport, they took it from me, from me for a long time. Couldn't travel, which I always used to do. My family, who couldn't accept the fact that they had another child than they thought they had. The same child, but in another form, maybe. I lost my partner, my friends, many of which couldn't understand what was happening, couldn't catch up with the speed that I move in. And then I got a Moroccan Dutch girlfriend. And this time I thought, oh my God, Zina, you have the most perfect curls. I'm a guy, no lesbian shit. This is gonna be amazing. <laughs> but I forgot one thing. There is one thing worse for a Muslim girl to be a lesbian, that's to, to date a Christian guy. <laughs> 
we can go back to the beginning pictures and be like, <laughs> and so there we went again, the hiding, the secrets, the in the closet, out of the closet, running away, pulling back, all of it. And in the middle of all of that, I, I had a choice to make because with my physical changes, I, I even look more like a Muslim than I used to. And basically, I just look like a Moroccan guy. And then I looked like a Moroccan teenager because that hair growth doesn't go like, in, doesn't grow instantly. So there I was, the 16 year old Mo, experiencing all the things that the other Mo's also experienced, but I had something to compare it with. I knew how it was to walk inside a room and have everyone listen. And now you couldn't even enter the room anymore and they would ask you to leave. And so, back to God, I decided, who am I? Monir means the one who gives light. So what is my goal in life to resonate with my higher calling, my deepest self, to be that light to others and to show and reflect the light of God that is so inclusive, so creative, so much more than dynamic than our small, small and limited mindsets. I'm going to show a love for the creation that is so much more diverse than we think the creation should be. And so I got back to studying Islam, but moreover, I started to keep the Ramadan, fasting, praying, going to mosques, and something funny happened, because when the whole world kicked me out, who stretched out to me, who invited me to their homes, who became my family, the Moroccan Dutch society. One by one, tweeted, Instagram, Facebook me, sent me emails, got my phone number, called me, brought me to hospitals, brought me back. And whereas the whole society was pulling me out, kicking me out, making me some sort of sexual object, it was the mosque who told me, when are you going to pray with us? Be welcome in our male entrance. While well, Dutch gyms were kicking me out because I couldn't change my clothes either in the female or male changing rooms. It were mosques would say, come pray, come be, come eat, come fast. And please say the Shahada so our ladies can marry you because there are many sisters waiting for you to convert. <laughs> Love my Heineken dough, as you can see. And so out of this very personal experiences with what identity politics causes on a daily basis and how we think we know the other, whereas in fact we don't even know what we are seeing when we look with our eyes, I realized that I had a role to play in the media to be an echo of those voices that are never heard and constantly hijacked. And that's how I started my series, The Hervormings Fundamentalist and The Reform Fundamentalist for the Groene Amsterdammer in which I write long reads, four or five thousand words each, portraits of young Moroccan thinkers here in the Netherlands, Turkish, Iraqi, Afghan, who talk about being a Muslim, who criticize ideas in their own religion, who criticize society, who reflect on their own lives, but moreover have a profession, a talent, an ambition, who are more than just that Muslim or that Moroccan or that boy, or that Mohammed. Actually, I interviewed many Mohammeds. And by every portrait I, make, I made, not only did I got a step deeper within those communities, but I also got a larger part of our society to reflect on their ideas and notions of what would Muslims would believe and think and how they would treat people. And they were surprised. They didn't believe me. Many times they told me, how can it be that you can, can pray in a mosque? That would be impossible. <laughs> You're not even a guy. And it reflected very clearly to me how they couldn't consider me a guy and how they couldn't accept that Muslims might be more open-minded or more in touch with who I was than they are. And so I had a lot of issues, of course. When I kept the Ramadan, I got emails from my grandma who never contacts me. My parents were in every state that you could think of because they were afraid for me to convert. And I was like, you know what? I believe in God. If that makes me a Muslim, let me be a Muslim. If that makes me Christian, let, let, let's, me, let's call me a Christian. But I believe in God and the truth will know you and the truth will set you free. Everything else is white noise. And so when I think of our society now, I think about how we look at people and we judge by the cover. We definitely judge every book by its cover. 
We look at someone and think we know his education, his background, his religion. And again, with me, you are definitely wrong. Whatever you thought you saw, <laughs> baby, no way. And, <clears throat> and so if it's so not applicable to me, why would it be applicable to anyone else? And that's what I think that we should start to look at people not in a one-dimensional frame, but in the multiple identities that we are. Nobody wants to be put in a one-dimensional box or category. And for everything we don't share, we have so much more in common. Let's say we have this white buckfeet smoother, you know, the, the mom with her big bike with the kids in the front. And uh, she's a vegan, of course, and she eats the vegan pies that are way too expensive, but never mind. And, you know, she never entered a mosque or a church. For her, Easter is all about a vegan dinner with friends and good wine and all that. And then she goes to the Turkish grocery store just to get her Turkish bread. What would she have in common with the Turkish butcher working there? She doesn't even meet, eat meat. Well, you would say nothing. He is a man, she is a woman. He is a Muslim, at least we assume that. Who knows what he's actually believing in? She is non-religious, although she's quite spiritual and does yoga, but never mind. <laughs> he is black, according to Dutch standards. For America, he wouldn't be. She is white. But they're both parents. And the kids are actually in the same school because the mom decided not to put her kids in a white school 20 kilometers away. And they both read the Volkskrant and are irritated by the bad framing. They both secretly love Celine Dion, but they cannot admit that to friends. <laughs> they have the same concerns about the street. They are, they are afraid for climate change now that autumn became the new spring. <laughs> they have so much in common and they will never realize. They will just smile and wave and smile and wave and never have a conversation. And never know the other's thoughts, stories. They will never realize how much they share because all they see is a one-dimensional identity. He is a Muslim, I'm not. He is a man, I'm not. He is Turkish, I'm not. Not even admitting that he is as much Dutch as she is. I really believe in embracing the multiple identity. I am not what the media makes me to be. But moreover, I am a light, and a light is supposed to shine on a hill now, why don't we shine bright together? Thank you. Manir, thank you so much for your incredible story. And your... Um, You're making uh, me shy, guys, come on. <laughs> Thank you for your incredible story and for your impassioned uh, view on veganism. I'm so sorry. I love my meat, you know. I know there are some people... You I'm know, working on it. ...shaking spinach at you as we speak. Um, wow. Who's got a question? Here's a question. What's your name and where'd you come from? What's your name and where'd you come from? Hi, my name is Julie. I'm a New Yorker, but I live here. Um, my, a statement first and then a question. First off, I apologize that somebody who did believe in faith and Christianity would ever say something like that to you, whether or not you're trans, Moroccan, uh, Egyptian, or whatnot. That's not what Jesus believed in, and I hope that you um, can take that. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to ask you is... Have you forgiven that particular, because particular, it feels like there might be, like, have you forgiven those kind of people who say that things about you? And does that, like, um, change how you see how things are? And I think, especially when we talk about, you know, to love your neighbor, to know, you know, your greatest love you can have for other people is to know, love your neighbor as your own. And maybe the connection is to actually get to know your neighbor. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you are the first Christian to ever say that, honestly. Um, so yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so <laughs> every single day, every single day, every single day till today, I get these comments. 
Do you have a dick? How long is it? How do you have sex? Do you even have sex? Sorry, I can't date you because I'm not a lesbian. Uh, it was great to meet you, but I would like to meet a real guy now. Um, yeah, sorry that we don't hire you, but you understand we can't hire people like you. Sorry, you can't get a haircut. You we don't keep, we don't like um, we don't cut hair of people like you. What is people of me? Well, just that. And that's only talking about the trans part. Now I'm not talking about the Christian, Muslim, whatever people else like. Every single day, every single conversation. Even this very morning, I was shouting to someone, if you call me transgender one more time, I'm just going to hang up the phone because I am not a one-dimensional box. And people make you that. And the moment they realize, say, but you have to understand, this is the first time for me to make, meet a transgender for real. Like, I'm some National Geographic, you know? <laughs> and <clears throat> it is very hard sometimes not to want to scream, but... I don't take it personal because people always say, how is it to be born in the wrong body? Well, let me adjust that for you. I wasn't born in the wrong body. I'm born in the wrong time. And I'm ahead of history in every single aspect, in every single aspect. And it's not a great position to be at. I wrote a novel 10 years ago writing about climate change. And the publisher said, no, that's far fetched. To say it's winter and summer and summer and winter is so way off. Well, now look at today. <laughs> I wrote about refugee crisis when there was no, no Arab revolutionary movements, no refugee crisis like that. And people said, where would all those refugees come from? Now we are wondering how we can get rid of them. And so I can keep saying thing after thing. I just have that gift, maybe. I don't know. But then, for me, the, the reason that I live today, the reason that I stand here that I can even smile is only and only because of the love of Jesus Christ. And it's because of that love that I can actually go inside a mosque and pray without any fear. Because I have a love that is bigger than every understanding. And so, no, I'm not scared to say a Muslim prayer like I would some, somehow be torn by lightning. Because God knows the intentions of my heart. And moreover, by being there, by showing compassion and love, I'm actually learning a lesson more than I'm teaching one. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Who has a question? Oh, of course it's over the other side, isn't it? God, Helen, you're never near me. It's a good me. workout. You're never near me when I need you. <laughs> What's your name, Helen, and where'd you come from? My name's Helen, I'm from the UK, but I live here. Um, you don't make things easy, that's what I was thinking when you're going through your story, it's quite a journey. Mm. Um, one of the, I'm also a Christian, um, and wow. I was listening to your... we can start a church here. We can, <laughs> we can compare crosses if you like. And uh, yeah, I was just struck by, you know, there's a message of being open and love and so on. And one of the things that I've noticed is that there's a big thing about white people, or the, you mentioned about the guy, the angry guy, mm. outside our time. And I don't know, there's like a, there seems to be a lack of, well, for me, everybody's equal. And we don't need to divide anybody in boxes because everybody's equal. And if you take that as your principle, we don't need to separate you and treat anybody differently or put a label in front of your you know, name, gender, gay, whatever. And I just wonder if, yeah, if you find yourself being negative against other groups, because I heard some of that. As in, what's the name? Hank and whatever you said? Hank yeah, and it sounded like you're using sort of stereotypes. and actually It's a stereotype you, of the Dutch politician yeah, who is a white extremist who thinks that an average Dutch person is Hank and Ingrid. So it was a joke, uh, which wasn't offensive of Hank and Ingrid, because I can tell you this. My uncle's name is Hendrik Jan Hank, and my cousin's name is Ingrid. You have to understand something. Aside of all the, the, the minorities in minorities in minorities that I am, I am half white. Okay, well, before you get into that, Munir, <laughs> Helen, <laughs> Helen, what was your question? Well, she was afraid that I have negative stereotypes. I, yeah, I yeah, and I was just wondering how that sort of reconciles with the sort of loving everyone and treating everyone yeah. as equal. So, let me sit for this one. It's a great... Don't get comfortable, because we haven't got much time. That's why I'm not sitting on a chair. Okay. It's a great idea that we are all equal, but we aren't treated all equal. And that's why I mention color, I mention things, because it matters still as long as there's no real equality. As long as I am suddenly scary in front of an Albert Heijn, 
Because what? Let's be honest. If it was Magritte, sorry for using you, standing there with her bike and her phone, would he ever, would he ever have done what he did? So color matters. Unfortunately, color matters. Magritte and I can do exactly the same thing, and people would actually be running towards him, like, why are you even bothering this beautiful blonde lady? Hey, can I have your number? So let's be very honest about this one. There is no equality still, and that's why I, I dare to mention color and all those things, even though it makes people very uncomfortable. But I am very aware of my grandma, who lives in a street where there is no one white person left, and where no one speaks Dutch even, and she doesn't feel safe. And I understand her journey, seeing me like this, not even being able to understand how she got an oldest grandchild who turned out to be me. I can see also her pain and her struggle out of her religious convictions. But by saying the truth, I'm not being unloving or unkind. Why would I be here? Why would I share my story? Why would I make myself vulnerable? Why would I even bother? Because I could say, well, biggest part of this crowd is white, so not, I'm not even going to talk to those people. That's what identity politics tries to teach us. I'm way beyond that. I see beautiful people that I want to know and I want to meet and I want to keep talking till we find the thing that connects us and not divides us. And if it's something else than our skin color, let's, let's face it, that's your loss because you love to be tanned. <laughs> okay, thank you. We um, need to uh, wrap up. Uh, we have one or two questions. Let's get back to be the change you want to see. What's your name and where to come from? My name is Nathalie, I'm from Lebanon. Uh, <laughs> Merci. Uh, Munir, I wanted to know, you know, because in our Arab countries, families are very important. Yes. And I do understand the, the challenge and the journey that this was for you and for them. Mm. I wanted to know, where are you guys now in your relationship? Well, here's another inconvenient truth for you. The only person who immediately said, of course he's a guy, why didn't you see it, was my Egyptian grandmother. <laughs> I, I love grandmothers. <laughs> I um, am not in touch with my white Dutch family, because they, they thought that the whole lesbian thing was already dirty and this is way beyond. I'm slowly getting back in touch with my parents. It's a very tough journey. And a lot of cancer had to be in the way for us to actually pave a way, which is a, a very tragic reason to be reconnected and reunited. Um, the only part of my family that I'm actually most in touch with is the poorest part of the family that has never traveled outside of Cairo, let's stand Egypt. And the poorer, the more open-minded they are, the less world experience, the more experienced they are and wiser. And for them, it was actually a great joy for me to be Monir, because now all my cousins, because I only have female cousins, can go out longer because they have a male chaperone, which is me. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> um, Monir, we uh, we're going to be selling books in the foyer. Um, I, 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 I wish I had more hands. One second. That was, that was artful. <laughs> so, God is groot. Eten, bidden en benminnen met Muslim. I love your accent. Thank it's you. It's amazing. Hartelijk dank. Um, <laughs> God is great. Eat, eat, pray, love with Muslims. Yes. It's going to be uh, in, on sale downstairs at the bar. And Munir will be signing. So, uh, gather around, gather around. All this the is free publicity. The wow. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, I see. All beautiful. Munir, thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming along. I hope we've, well, I've certainly learned something. Uh, I hope that um, we can go away and learn a bit more from those times and those moments that kick us in the fucking ass. And we can overcome them and we do learn something and we do move on. Now. What now, sir? She was saying to me, I'm so shy, I can't get on stage, I'm so shy. And now she's taking my microphone. I just got the approval for our pop-up store. Yay! Open, yeah, yeah. 
It's going to be at the Johannes Verhulstraat oh, in outside. Fun, you are coming. I'm so good to there. Leave yeah, man. Home. I know two people I'm taking. Second week of uh, November. Come on. So Johannes Verhulstraat. Number 35. Number 35. Uh, congratulations on your pop-up. See? See, stuff happens. So thank you so much for coming to She Says. Uh, please do keep in touch with us on Instagram, on Facebook. You will learn when the next event will be. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dimfi and the crowd at Pakas Svaiga, who are wonderful partners to play with here. I want to thank all our speakers, Melody, Velemain, Magrit, Manir, Erevin. I want to thank Finch Factor, the Finch Factor crew, in particular Zita and Maxime, who have been just excellent in uh, making this event work. And I want to thank you folks for coming along this evening. Let's go and drink in the bar downstairs, ladies and gentlemen. See you there.